today's agenda, um, and that is a report from the CLA and the city attorney relative to preparing and presenting documents necessary to place before the voters at the May 2013 city election a ballot measure to permit the CLA upon a finding of need by the city council to employ attorneys to provide legal services to the CLA. And while that is the scope of our agenda item, I, I want to say at the outset as the maker of the motion that initiated that, that um, certainly my objective, uh, and I hope the objective of this meeting will, uh, is not limited only to looking to charter amendments that would be on the ballot, but rather looking more broadly at the issue of how uh, our governance structure can be improved, particularly when it comes to issues relating to the uh, preparation of our legislative work product within uh, the City Council. And uh, uh, it, lest there be any doubt, I want to, again, for probably the, I've said this multiple times, but I'll say it again, um, my motivation in this uh, was not intended to uh, point fingers or find fault. Um, the uh, city, the people who work at the city attorney's office are working under very, very difficult circumstances right now, trying to meet the priorities of this city uh, in defending the city, uh, in prosecuting uh, crimes, and in performing all of the various advisory and administrative tasks uh, that they have. And uh, they're doing it with inadequate resources. And so um, my concern was not uh, driven by any suggestion that the city attorney was uh, failing to perform their function. To the contrary, it was uh, my concern that the city council take ownership and responsibility for its own legislative product. Um, we are elected officials, the city attorney is an elected official, and my view was that the legislative product should reside in the legislature to the greatest degree possible, and that includes in the drafting of ordinances. So um, that was my objective, and I hope that this has sparked a discussion that will allow us to um, take more control of our legislative product in the council, and also to establish um, some working understandings with the city attorney's office as to how uh, these two divisions of our government can interface in a more productive and efficient and effective way. So um, I'd like to invite my colleagues, if you'd like to say anything at the outset before we uh, bring up the city attorney and the CLA. Uh, Mr. Reyes. Yes, I just want to take a moment to um, amplify the uh, gratitude I have for the city attorneys who are working the long hours, uh, the weekends, as Chair of Plum, it's very evident to me that we have a very, very hardworking uh, presence of, of people who have the whole city in mind and that they have demonstrated the ability to give us options and how we look at uh, our policies and our options. But I also know that there have been times where we have been uh, under uh, environments that made me personally, and this is myself speaking, uh, question whether I was being given options or I was being told what I needed to do based on assumptions that did not reflect my own sense of, of direction in terms of analyzing what's in front of us. And um, But that does not take away from the very hardworking attorneys we have in the city attorney's office and especially the frontline folks who are working under uh, duress and uh, I can't tell you enough, especially these holidays, how much I appreciate those sacrifices. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Mr. Kretz? I think uh, that was well said by Mr. Reyes. I think we've had uh, <coughs> some frustrations with the, with the uh, in my office, uh, particularly with, with the speed of some of these the work product, but not without the understanding that the city attorney's office is, is dramatically underfunded in my view, uh, uh, you know, far beyond where it should be. Um, and it makes all of the pieces of the city attorney's work product more difficult. Um, and we appreciate uh, everyone's hard work under uh, dramatically difficult circumstances. But at the same time, we do want to uh, be able to uh, have a process that's more responsive to the council's needs. Um, I don't know whether, whether we actually need to uh, change the structure formally um, as, as is proposed or just find a way to uh, 
work this more effectively and change the structure within the existing structure of the city attorney's office, which would be my my greater hope. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chris. We have um, two members of the public who'd like to address the ad hoc committee, so we're going to take public comment uh, on the matter first, and then we'll invite up the uh, city attorney's office and the CLA. Uh, our first speaker is Antonia Ramirez, and uh, we'll go ahead and do two minutes per speaker. And uh, Ms. Ramirez will be followed by Noel Weiss. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to start by saying thank you to Mr. David Hirsch, who is behind me, who was very helpful, most informative, and didn't give me the roll of the eyes. I asked him for simple inf questions about this meeting, and he was gracious, and I do thank him for that. Having said that, I'd like to start by saying clearly there has been a horrendous meltdown and communications document breakdown between the CLA, the city attorneys, and the council members. Because all three groups within the LA City Hall have failed to objectively report and fairly prepare urgently needed documents to evaluate um, and make eventually accessible to us, the voters. What the CLA, the city attorneys, and the city council members should have been preparing meticulously and presenting to us, the voters, for drastic measures are public safety issues, which are in dire need. It's another nuclear reactor waiting to explode, and that being the Latino gangbangers and criminal illegal aliens. I'm admonishing all three groups that if you don't rectify these societal wrongs from within, you'll end up like the ex-chief Daryl Gates. Quit playing the political game. Start by doing your jobs ethically, morally, legally, and responsibly, and be, you will be held accountable, not by your peers, but by we, the people of the United States of America. Um, and I, again, once you quit playing those political games, and start buckling down to doing your jobs ethically, morally, because in the long run, it will pay off. Everything else will fall into place. Don't say, I've got to pander to these groups because they're doing the jobs that nobody else is doing, and blah, blah, blah. Cut, cut the crap on that. Let's start focusing on the people, the majority. Let's start working for the people, by the people, and take some pride within. As we say in Spanish, huevos. Get up there and do the right thing, and you'll end up being happy. No more Prozac, no more lithium, and God knows what else. You'll be happy. I'm happy. I carry my bags because I have to take on these gangbangers and illegals. But I'm not playing the political game, but I feel good. I feel happy. Thank and having said that, I want to thank also by hiring the right people within. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Mercer. We're out of time. Okay. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mr. Weiss. Happy holidays. And you as well. Thank you. Mr. Weiss. Thank you, uh, Chairman Kikorian and members. Um, I'm here uh, to make general comment on this particular motion. Um, I think uh, there's been a tendency in the past for the city council members to confuse the role of the city attorney as protecting their political interests as opposed to the broader public interest and the legal rights of the city vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular issue at hand. Too often, particularly in land use rights, we have the city attorney basically running interference for the uh, political interest, the special interest, the constituent friendly uh, individual or developer who the council member wants to promote. We've seen it again and again and again with Mr. Koretz giving away, uh, like candy, variances and other land use entitlements. City attorney stands by and does nothing. It's not right. City attorney is the attorney for the people. This is not a corporation. In, in, the, in the traditional sense. This is a public trust. Uh, if we're talking about amending the charter, we need to amend the charter to make it clear that the City of Los Angeles, the City Council of Los Angeles, where the power resides, is a public trust. We, the people, are the fiduciaries of that public trust, and the ethical responsibilities that flow to the, to the, um, uh, to the City Attorney's Office or, or come out of the City Attorney's Office basically means that they have to represent those fiduciary interests. Uh, and where there's a conflict between the broader public interest and your political interest, the broader public interest wins. That hasn't been the case. I interpret this entire process as an attempt to try to basically restrain the city attorney from doing what he basically needs to be done. Going forward, if you really want to do something that's, that, that, that's consistent, that's competent, and by the way, I don't know, we need some public uh, revelation about how much money was spent on the last lawyer that you hired for the council because you've done that before, whether or not that's still ongoing is another matter, but going forward, and we need that public disclosure, but I think also, um, the city attorney needs to be that check and balance, and I think this kind of motion gives the impression that perhaps the council wants to try to load it over the city attorney, and it's up to the city attorney to hold firm uh, and, and maintain the, the, the integrity uh, of that office relative to uh, uh, what's really required so that we don't um, confuse 
the broader public interests with the special interests of the uh, uh, I I individual council members. So um, I, I don't know, I guess I was looking at the clock, but it looks like it's kind of stuck on 70. So I appreciate yeah, the opportunity zero, to make yeah. the, uh, the, the, the comments, and Thank I hope you. that we can make the system work better, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. Mr. Reyes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I, and just for the record, um, as we're listening to Mr. Weiss, an attorney, it is unfortunate that he fails to see the amount of work I've seen my colleague, Councilman Koretz, promote when he's making decisions. He does address the stakeholders. I've seen him organize various points of view. I've seen analysis that speaks to uh, various uh, difficult land use issues. And the role of the committee is to assess all different perspectives, although one might not prevail over the other. Uh, it is a process in which we need to achieve some level of decision making. Unfortunately, Mr. Weiss may might not fall on the way he sees the world or the way he interprets his facts, but the reality is in the committee, I want to thank Councilman Kretz for his hard work and his staff in reaching out and organizing and looking at all the different stakeholders' issues. I need to say that for the record. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Mr. Oh, I just wanted to thank Mr. Reyes for his comments. Thank you. Um, you know, I think um, the public comment was a good lead-in to our, our discussion, uh, which we're about to start, because um, certainly the checks and balances argument is um, one that, uh, you know, we hear often. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, in virtually no other government setting uh, does an elected uh, attorney provide a check and balance to the legislative process. It doesn't happen in Congress. It doesn't happen in the state legislature. It doesn't happen in the county board of supervisors. It happens in very, very few cities uh, in America. And we have a unique and unusual situation where an elected official um, plays a role in the legislative process of other elected officials. And so, uh, I, you know, when, as we talk about checks and balances and the people's representatives and so on, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are 15 members of the city council who are elected by the people as the people's representatives to write the people's legislation. And that's our job to do. Um, the city attorney's job is not to do that for us. Uh, the city attorney's job is not to legislate. Uh, the city attorney's job is to advise the city uh, and to defend the city and to prosecute criminals. Our job is to le legislate. So I, I, I sometimes find it remarkable that um, some feel that a certain kind of elected official is for some reason expected to be more representative of the people than other elected officials. So I'll just leave it at that for now and I'd like to invite uh, the representatives of the city attorney's office up as well as our uh, CLA. And I'd like to start um, this with just kind of a uh, quick overview because, um, and let me say first that um, particularly uh, to the representatives, representatives of the city attorney's office that I, I very much appreciate the really productive conversations that, that we've had um, about how to make this whole system work more effectively. Um, it's been very encouraging to me. I think we've had a lot of good ideas that we've discussed and, um, and it's been uh, very helpful. And I think t as a start of this discussion, we might frame uh, what it is that uh, the charter provides in terms of the city attorney's role in particularly with, with regard to the legislative process because um, I think we've been operating uh, in with certain assumptions that are not exactly mandated by the charter um, but more by practice and uh, by council rule uh, in terms of uh, the, the city attorney's role in drafting all of our ordinances. So why don't we start with that and um, I guess um, I, I'd like to invite uh, you to make in, any introductory comments you'd like to make but, but also if we can um, you know, start off by uh, speaking to the issue of whether the charter even mandates the model that we operate under or not. 
Well, if, if I may, just in speaking yes. about the charter itself and, and the role of the city attorney, we are we are uh, designated, if you will, as the as we're on the air. I'm sorry, is it on? Introduce yourself. To. Yeah, I'm sorry, Pete Echevarria from the city attorney's office. <clears throat> the charter designates the city attorney as the attorney for the city of Los Angeles, and if I may, just take a step back. That's who we consider to be our client, and under the rules of professional conduct, our client is the entity, which is the city of Los Angeles, the people of the city of Los Angeles in that sense, that they make up the city. Speaking through its highest body or official that is authorized to speak on any given matter, in virtually all matters, that's the city council. So when we communicate to our client, generally speaking, we're communicating to the city council ultimately on, on any given matter. But that's what we see as our client. It's the city of Los Angeles, and our, our obligation is ultimately to the city as an entity. That being said, we are designated as the sole legal advisor to the city. And so when there are questions of legality or a request for advice as to legality, that, that falls upon us, and we're, we're the designated entity to do that. The charter itself doesn't speak about ordinances and the preparation of ordinances by the city attorney. It talks about the adoption of ordinances by the city council, the requisite number of votes, um, the times of uh, first reading, second reading, and so on. But it does not require that the city attorney prepare or, um, or even approve ordinances. The rules require that. And I think council rules. Council rules. And I, I, I believe that. I wasn't here when those rules were originally drafted, but the thinking was that the council needs some degree of satisfaction that the actions that it takes are, in fact, legally defensible. Uh, and that it is an, on solid ground in terms of its, the actions that it takes. That being said, I've pointed out to you in our discussions that there are a number of ordinances that come to council that are in fact prepared by departments or other offices and that are provided to us for review and approval and sign off and then they're transmitted to council having been prepared by another office or department. There, there, we don't have a monopoly on that. There were several ordinances today I think dealing with street lighting that were prepared by the department and our attorneys reviewed and signed and they were presented to you. So that's, that's a, a function that can be report, pre, excuse me, performed by others and is in fact performed by others at this point other than our review and approval as to legality. That could happen to a greater degree if that were the, the council's desire. Um, I, I would urge that the rules not be modified, that I would think that you would want to make sure that your ordinances are, in fact, approved as to legality. Um, we, we had a discussion, too, about the possibility that approval might be withheld or, or delayed for other than, for other reasons, or for policy reasons rather than for the, uh, other appropriate reasons. And that shouldn't occur. Uh, it should never occur, to my knowledge. It, it hasn't occurred, and certainly not in the time that I've been reviewing and approving ordinances. Um, but that can be addressed as well. And that can be addressed in situations where a matter is of such importance to the council that you choose to suspend your rules and go ahead and approve an ordinance that does either has not been returned to you or has not been approved by us. Within the last year, I can think of at least one instance, perhaps two, where we did not give our approval to an ordinance that was nevertheless approved by the council. So that does happen as well. The mechanism exists. All that to be said is uh, to say this, as we've said before, and I, I just want to touch on this, that we've gone on record as to the reasons why we think that the proposal of a charter amendment would be would not be a good idea, um, either in terms of serving the the, uh, the people of the city and uh, in terms of an effective uh, system of providing you legal advice without creating divisiveness and acrimony within the city. Mm. Okay. If I Mr. may. Carter. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, William Carter, on behalf of the City Attorney's Office. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be here. Uh, to follow up on uh, what uh, Pete has said, I won't belabor uh, Charter Section 271, because it's, it's, I, I was actually surprised when you look at what 271 doesn't say. It does not say that the City Attorney is responsible for drafting ordinances. It says we, you know, we represent the City. So what I asked our uh, ex in-house expert, uh, Pete is really the expert, but we have uh, someone that does a lot of uh, research, and I asked him to go back and look at the largest cities in the state and what they do say where you have an elected city attorney and what it says about uh, 
drafting ordinances. And I was actually surprised because those other cities have sections that require the city attorney to draft ordinances. And I went and I looked at the following cities that do have elected city attorneys. Uh, San Diego, San Francisco, Long Beach, Oakland, uh, Chula Vista, Compton, Huntington Beach, uh, Redondo Beach, uh, San Rafael. And in the, and we, those are the largest uh, where they have elected. And in those, I'll give you an example where the, um, it says the city attorney shall prepare in writing all ordinances. So in those particular cities, which surprised me, the city attorney is specifically, elected city attorney is specifically uh, directed to draft the ordinances, which surprised me. I didn't think I would find that. And I do have a chart, and I'll be more than happy to provide that. I'll show it to uh, Jerry Miller. Uh, but uh, we looked at that, and there's also a government code section, which surprised me. Government Code Section 41802, uh, when it deals with general law cities, uh, the government code requires all city attorneys to, to prepare and draft city ordinances and resolutions by the legislative body. And there are 361 general law cities within the state of California. Now, these are general law cities where you typically have appointed, not right. elected. So the appointed basically acts at the, at the uh, will uh, of the, the, point of the uh, council body or the legislative body. So I understand that. But what surprised me was the elected part. Having said that, because the city of LA's charter actually doesn't require us to draft ordinances, that's where I think we have an opportunity, as, as Pete said, to work with the council on how to uh, solve this problem that we may have, whether it be a priority issue, a resource issue, an availability issue. And I, and I felt it's been very productive over the last few weeks working with you, Councilman Krikorian, and your staff and others to identify how we might be able to resolve some of these problems that we have. And uh, as, we've, as we said, I see, from my vantage point, really three issues. One is, uh, the City Council giving us the, the direction what you believe to be the priority or priorities could be a fee issue, a fiscal issue, a revenue issue, a public safety issue, and really focusing us on that because if not, we end up doing triage. What is, you know, who's available, uh, who can do it, who has expertise, uh, is it the president asking us to do this, or is it a certain committee asking us to do this? And we struggle internally to get uh, matters done in a timely fashion. So we internally have tried to triage, is it a revenue generation, a fee issue, or a public safety issue? And when we do that, Pete and I work very uh, uh, much uh, every day trying to identify what is it we need to get focused on? And certainly during the, these budget times, we try to focus on those fee matters. And I know, uh, uh, Councilman, uh, Council Member Reyes, we are very much focused on these development agreements and, and plans, and trying to get things through plumb, because if we get those done, then it generates jobs, revenue, and gets everything started. Exactly. The second issue for us is resources. We try to identify who can do what when because given we, all city departments have suffered through these long years, and ERIP was devastating to us, just like everybody else. So we try to focus on who's available, who can draft it, and in a timely manner get it drafted. But the third piece is very important, and that is our city departments. We have various city departments that we rely on, whether it be, I'm just naming names, uh, just for hypothetically planning or public department of uh, public safety or, or a building and safety or a fire department say you know we need a survey we need a study we need something and so that's the third piece that we all have to work on because uh, uh, if we're not all on the same page at the same time it, it won't get done it in a timely manner so um, that's a long way of saying LA is is it's actually it was surprising to me uh, when you really look at 271, we're not specifically designated to draft it, unlike other cities, 
So it does give us an opportunity to work with the council right. and the CLA on who does the drafting. And having been in Sacramento, for, I was there for two and a half years, I saw who normally drafted legislation. And they normally drafted it during a certain time period of the year. And so you could see this ebb and flow of when things were going to hit you and when you had to review it okay. and when it had to get to the legislative body. So it was kind of an eye-opener for me when I came to the city to see it was different. And that's certainly an issue that impacts your office because Correct. we legislate year-round. And we, we're constantly throwing out new ideas, new issues, um, and it really doesn't take much more than a eight-vote majority to right. instruct the city attorney to do something. And um, that's where I think the biggest challenge for your office comes, because without some guidance from the council as, as to what's most important, um, it, it's there's no context in which you can prioritize and in my view it's virtually impossible to draw a priority between the legislative role and the law enforcement prosecution role and the civil defense role um, those are all critical roles but they're apples oranges and pears and I don't know how you um, you know, can, can really effectively prioritize uh, there. Now, you mentioned a, a number of other cities, Mr. Carter, and, and of course the general law cities I, I, I would clearly distinguish because the city right. attorney is an appointed official in virtually all, if not all, of those. And, and that, I think, is a material difference because um, while you're trying to do your prioritization of these tasks, just like a law enforcement, any law enforcement agency has to exercise prosecutorial discretion in deciding where to allocate resources. And there are some priorities, some things that are less prior, uh, less uh, lower priority. Um, if an elected official is making the decision about what is, how to prioritize resources, that prioritization process may in fact be um, influenced by the uh, the concerns of that elected official, political policy or otherwise, which may be different than the prioritization of another body of elected officials, and that's why this that's where this unique well, I shouldn't say unique, but this unusual circumstance uh, of ours becomes more of an issue. And, and as I turn it to uh, Mr. Miller, uh, Mr. Carter mentioned a number of other cities. I know the CLA's office uh, did an analysis, a uh, comparison of a number of other cities as well. This was some time ago now in response to a motion by Ms. Perry. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your findings have been um, both in terms of comparison with other cities, other models that uh, you're aware of that uh, that might be useful to this discussion, and then whatever other introductory comments you want to make. Uh, certainly, uh, Jerry Miller, Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, our uh, our research largely showed similar information. There were um, um, large cities with elected city attorneys. There are large cities with appointed city attorneys. There are. Um, for instance, I believe it's, it's Oakland and San, San Jose or Oakland has an elected city attorney, but they prepare ordinances as directed by the council. It doesn't necessarily require them to direct all council or all ordinances. There's a, an additional layer here, <clears throat> and in some specific cases, this, the councils have the ability to contract out for services, which does not exist here. Uh, the, the, the charter is very specific that city attorney has to approve any contracts. So uh, again, there, there, are, there are models across the board. Um, so I don't know that you can point to any single model that says this is the way th that it has to occur. Um, but again, without delving into some more of the, the details on some of these other cities, uh, you know, it's hard to say how they get around the issues that you're facing, which is exactly as, as you articulated. You are held accountable by the voters of the city for making policy. And the only way you can make that policy is to have, for the most part, ordinances before you to enact. That's how you develop and enact that, those policies. So at the end of the day, since you're held accountable by the voters, a union mechanism through which you can hold people responsible for giving you that legislation accountable as well. And again, I think that's where, where um, 
uh, the, the real issue is here. I want to be very clear that I'm not referring to the current city attorney. I've been in the CLA's office now since 98, and this has always been an issue. Um, you know, so, so this is not unique, and I know the city attorney is working very hard with very limited resources, and they very appropriately have laid out for you what their, their priorities are, which are public safety uh, and, and litigation are the top two priorities, saving money and protecting the public. That's entirely appropriate. But at the end of the day, you have to have the, the, the policy issues before you so that you can establish policy for the citizens of L.A. And I will say, I think it, my vision for this is to help the council be more effective in, in our legislative process as well. Because what we do now, frankly, is we pass motions uh, calling for ordinances. And those motions might be awfully vague and it might be conceptual in nature. And then it's left to the city attorney to figure out, okay, what does that really mean and how do we boil that down into actual policy language, which is the ordinance itself. Then by the time it comes back to us, um, maybe we shouldn't be, but I think many of us feel kind of bound to say, well, that's the ordinance. We, if we send it back, if we make any changes to it, it's we're not going to be able to get anything done because it's going to have to go back and be redone and everything. So we pretty much, the, in, instead of the ordinance language being the basis for council's debate, it's at the tail end of the debate. It's after the debate is concluded that we bring the ordinance back and we just uh, tend to pass it through with minimal changes, if, if any changes. And I, th I think our debate will be more focused, more um, substantive, if we actually are debating particular language of particular sections. And so, um, just to, to bring this home a little bit, so Council Rule 38 that we, we currently operate under requires that um, the city attorney review all ordinance languages for form and legality before it is introduced to the council. Um, and it doesn't, even Rule 38 doesn't require for the actual drafting of the ordinance by the city attorney. It merely requires for legality, uh, form and legality review. Um, but it does require that that be done before it's introduced before the council. Right. And um, in my view, that might be an area for possible modification so that while, there, while the city attorney would re, re, retain the ability to review for f legality and form, it needn't necessarily be at the front end before the language is introduced, but it has to be done at some point before the ordinance becomes uh, enacted. That, that would be one thought that I have as, as uh, a way to, to streamline this. But, um, but I, I share your surprise, Mr. Carter, in looking at the the charter and seeing that some of the authority and power of the city attorney's office is very explicitly delineated as, for example, with approving bond language and uh, pre-approving contracts and all of the other things. The one thing that's glaringly missing is the drafting of ordinances and, you know, uh, inclu inclusio unum est exclusio alterius. So. <laughs> What he, <laughs> what he said. Well, but by specifying by specifying certain things, we it it is expected that the people in enacting the charter excluded those things that are not specifically delineated. So I thought it was a turkey uh, dinner. Yeah, that, <laughs> no. you know, I, I probably horribly mangled the pronunciation, but uh, Mr. Reyes. Yes, I um, I appreciate the the level of debate we're having here as initial discussion. One of the Factors I think I'd like to explore is how is technology helping us out with efficiencies and reviewing this information, this data. Uh, just recently in, in Plum Committee, we assigned the uh, building and safety and planning to start looking at uh, changing the process so where with technology we assign a number to a project. That number goes through the process, public works plugs in for plan B, uh, B permit issues. Uh, uh, all the land use impacts uh, policy. So now the customer, our clients, our constituents, aren't the ones going to 10 different counters to go to a actual trailing of a project, but it's actually one number, one project, and we're all connected to it, and it's available 
through uh, the website or whatever means they're going to be proposing. I just see that there's a lot of parallels here with how we're looking at our workload and understanding that we've been severely cut, understanding that we've lost a great amount of institutional knowledge in how process usually is performed. Uh, are we looking at technology to help us get through some of these issues of, an, of how we look at the language so that we don't we don't find ourselves in a position where we're questioning why is the ordinance in this form? Why aren't they getting to the objective of our motion? So what's coming back does not reflect my intention. Uh, there's a different intention here based on whatever political assumptions might be made. And, and that's a gray area I'm, I'm hoping we can, we can address. Let me give you an example. We, we, we strive to use technology as best we can. And we're very limited in our technology, by the way. We, my computer, even an old dog like me, I, I, I use the computer and I use the word processing capabilities and the communication capabilities as well, and research. I, th I do all that through a computer as well. I, I still like to go to the library and grab a book and open it up because I like skimming through the sections before and after and doing all that too. But we use technology as much as we can. So let me give you an example. The, the um, recent ordinance on skate bombing, the skateboard bombing, uh, we were able through the internet and then contacts also with some of the other <coughs> cities, find out what other cities were doing, actually read their ordinances, pull them down and see what, which one had the better language from our perspective as we understood the intent of council in, in requesting the ordinance and then prepare it through our, through our um, word processing ability, capabilities. So we were able to do that. Uh, very effectively. There are data banks that the League of California Cities has on ordinances uh, and other cities have uh, make theirs available as well. So w we're able to use it in that way. Now why it might look different sometimes from what the intention of the of the uh, maker of the motion is that sometimes we're not totally privy to the thinking of the maker of the motion. The, the wording in the motion may not totally convey what the intent was. Um, and so we had some discussions with on the, on the uh, skateboard bombing ordinance, we had some discussions with the maker of the motion as to what it was that he did, in fact, intend. That this is what he had in mind. Um, in part, being new to the council, we needed to have that process just so that he would know what, what we go through in preparing an ordinance as well. And in that case, we ended up sending two ordinances to committee for consideration and then adoption of the one that, was, that best suited the intention of the council when it ultimately voted. So, yes, we use technology. We believe that our technology is not outdated, but is out, outmoded a little bit and uh, needs improvement. There, isn't, there aren't the resources right now to improve it, but we sure would like to use it even more. If I may, I, I, I think, thank you, I think the, you've hit it uh, right on the head, Councilman uh, Reyes, is building and safety and planning, those where I think we really have to have technological upgrades so they can, uh, identify consistently the project or the activity or the person. We internally have tried to do that when we deal with code enforcement. We, we marry it not to the person but to the site. What, unfortunately what happens is sometimes a number is given to a person or an entity and then that could be anywhere. But if you marry it to the property or you marry it to the parcel, then it's clear and that's how we identify who that person is or what the activity is. But uh, technology is key, and I think it's going, just like in the medical field, if you can elect, uh, uh, make this electronic data easily retrievable. I know our people are pretty conversant mm -hmm. on uh, that database, yeah. uh, that planning, and, and, and you folks are, are uh, used, because they get on it and they see where a project is, and sometimes it's not on there because maybe it's a data uplink problem and, and we have to figure out what's really going on. Then you have to go to the file to really, and that, as Pete said, sometimes our people say, I need to go to the file because I'm not sure if that data is really in there or it's correct. So, um, yeah, technology is key uh, for us, not just in building and safety and planning, but other areas. And, and, and to me, the, the, uh, the change I had to deal with was having come from Sacramento, I would see language from the author or the sponsor and, and I would see what we're dealing with. What is it that this person wants? Give me the basic framework and the language that we can work with. But here, 
uh, you get a motion that says, I want a, I want an ordinance that deals with parking or something. And you're not really sure what is it they're after? What, what, are, what is it that you want us to do? And then um, what would be nice is to have either language or an example. Someone says, I like what they do in San Francisco. See what they do in San Francisco? That's what I want. And now I... And we sometimes get that, but not, not all. Now, internally, we have this fight because I have... There are people in my office that say, I'd rather start from scratch so I know it's legal. I can do all the research and I can figure it out. And I'll have to say, we don't have the luxury of that. We just don't. We can't build it. We can't reinvent the wheel every time. Now, there were people in my office before ERIP. Now, I look at Pete for everything. I go to Pete, and, and he can tell me because he has the institutional and the legal experience. But there were people that we had in our office that had been doing things for 20, 30 years. And you can say, have you seen this before? Yes, that's okay. Let's just go with it. Let's modify it and get it out the door. We are now rebuilding the team that that has that is now here after ERIP. And they're doing a great job, but we just don't have enough people with enough experience. So to the extent that we can work with the CLA or others who have draft language or language that, that mirrors where you want to be, that would give us a tremendous head start. And then we could work on the research and, and make sure it, it, it complies uh, to the law, as we it, understand Exactly. It. And before I go to you, Mr. Ma I think that that is a key point. One of my questions for you was going to be, what can we do on, on the council side better to make the job of, of the completion of the ordinances more efficient uh, and more accurately reflective of the council's intention. The obvious one is to provide you with language that you then can uh, review and analyze and pass upon the legality of. And, and I think that goes again to the idea that that process would be facilitated by actually having someone in the CLA's office do the drafting uh, of ordinances, an attorney uh, with housed within CLA who could do that and then have the ordinance submitted for review of form and legality, um, which is, I, again, I think going in the direction of what I, I, just for the clarity of the record, we all do agree that there is nothing in the law, in the charter or the law now, prohibiting the council from doing exactly that today. We could if it's a matter of budget, but if we wished to fund a, le a position for a lawyer in the CLA's office today to perform that function, do we all agree that there's nothing prohibiting us from doing that? Not completely. Why? Uh, because I, I, I believe that, that the fact that it would be designated as a lawyer would be problematic. There's nothing wrong, and there's been lawyers employed by the CLA before, but it could be, some, it could be an administrative assistant who's very knowledgeable. Got Jerry, Sharon... Uh, Karen, a number of AFOC can draft all can draft ordinances as well as most of my, the lawyers in my office. So the fact that you would designate someone who require that it be a lawyer would, by definition, then require that somebody's performing lawyer functions, and that's problematic. That's the problem. We have we do have as as distinguished from the state itself, we have a unitary form of government. We're a corporation. We're not a, a tripartite government with, with different branches. Mm -hmm. And so we have one lawyer for the city. And the, the designation of somebody to perform legal services, I don't see the preparation of ordinances necessarily as legal services. There are legal aspects to it, which would be met by the review as to, as to legality by our office. But I don't see that you require somebody to be a, a lawyer. That's the only point okay. that, in which I would differ. Okay. They could be a lawyer. You don't have to require them. Mr. Miller, you wanted to jump in. I uh, I, I did, and, and really, it's it's along these same lines. Um, I, I did have an attorney on staff um, uh, for six years. He has since left. I, as a matter of fact, I've always had attorneys uh, in the CLA's office. Uh, most of them had not been active members of the bar, but had um, uh, JDs and had been members of the bar at some point, uh, and I still do. But what it comes down to is what Mr. Carter. The frustration that he expressed, which is the same frustration I think that you that you see, the preparation of ordinance, particularly on big policy issues, it's an iterative, iterative process. Yes. Whether it's medical marijuana, whether it's mm -hmm. billboards, whether it's inclusionary zoning, whether it's um, density bonuses, whether you name it, uh, you're likely to get sued on all of those. And quite honestly, 
I'm hamstrung in working with you to get the city attorney what they need to sign off on a final ordinance because I don't have the staff resources with the legal knowledge, the ability to do the legal research to help you deal with your legal advisors on how to craft the final policy ordinances. That is the crux of the matter. I believe what you need is to be able to have legislative counsel and have an attorney-client relationship that is not the legal advisor to the council per se or to the city. That is the city attorney's role. And I don't get the sense that there are many people that are seriously looking at wanting to split the city attorney's office. I think what you're trying to accomplish is the goal that you've articulated is to get the resources you need to produce those ordinances. So that's where the breakdown occurs. And I will tell you with, with Han Dao, it was somewhat frustrating because the city attorney made it very clear there was not an attorney-client uh, relationship there. Uh, Mr. Dow was a legislative analyst, uh, um, you know, and, and he, but he was a great value to the office. I, and I will give you one example, and again, it's the previous administration, um, which some of you are familiar with. It's the Las Lomas project out in the valley. Now, at the time, City Attorney Doug Adio's office advised the council that under the Subdivision Map Act, you had to process that EIR, even though it was outside the city. In fact, in its current configuration, could not have been annexed into the city, but that we were obligated under the Subdivision Map Act to process that EIR. And Mr. Smith at the time couldn't figure that out. Um, Mr. Um, um, Padilla at the time couldn't figure it out. Santa Clarita didn't want it to happen. So to be quite honest, um, after I hired Mr. Dow, he looked into it, worked with the city attorney's office. At the end of the day, the council decided it would not proceed with that EIR. And in fact, what that ended up doing is saving a lot of time and resources. So I, I, I wouldn't dare to suggest to you that I want to be the legal advisor to the, to, to the council. I have my own issues to deal with. But what I do think is important is that I have the resources so that you can develop the policy initiatives that you need to develop. And, and obviously these are usually not very bright lines. The distinction between where the legal advice ends and the policy decisions begin, uh, very muddled I think at best. And especially under our current process where we, you know, by motion are delegating considerable policy discretion to the city attorney's office in just the way you described, Mr. Carter, where you're, you're st stuck trying to figure out what it is that the council really wants to achieve. And you're, uh, I mean, frankly, typically not given a, a lot of very precise guidance on that, which essentially leaves you in the default position of having to make policy decisions whether you like it or not, because you're bringing an ordinance back. Sometimes maybe you can bring two ordinances back, like you said, right. but, but you're, you're left guessing about what the policy objective is. And I think that's that inability to draw a precise distinction between what is legal and what is policy well, is, is at sort of the heart of, of this issue and the, the distinction that you're drawing, Mr. If Trump. I may, uh, yes and no. Uh, we're not shy about asking. The, the maker of a motion, what the intent is. We're not shy about asking for further direction. Um, and ha or the, uh, pursuant to Rule 38 or without it, asking the, the operating departments involved what views they have and as to how something should be addressed if they know the intent. And we do that. Right. So it, it, we're talking about, I think, Las Lomas, fortunately, I was not involved in that decision and giving that advice, and, and I'm glad. Um, but and I won't be an apologist for, for past actions of the city attorney's office that I had nothing to do with. But nonetheless, that, that's an exception in my mind. And there, there may be other examples, but to me those are exceptions rather than the rule. The, the rule, as far as I'm concerned, is to find out what it is the, that the maker of the motion or the council as a body intended, and then to write it to that. That takes time. I agree. And if we have somebody involved who has their pulse, their finger on the pulse of the council and knows exactly what that is, then I welcome that input. We always look for it, and we welcome it. And, and that is a, a distinction, though, because the maker of the motion is not the one who gets to decide what the council intended. The council, right. as a body, voted body. on something. And if we voted on a policy direction, and the ma it's not up to the maker of the motion to decide what that Absolutely. meant when the council voted by a majority vote. So the problem is if we don't have specific instructions to you, whatever the maker of the motion says, they don't speak for the council. And so 
you know, you're left guessing. Anyway, Mr. Yes. Kratz, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, a few things, because I guess there's different parts of the process where things may get held up. Um, I know looking at another city, uh, having been a, a staffer in West Hollywood in the early days, um, when there was legislation that the council member I wanted that I worked for uh, wanted to move forward, and I was writing it, I'm not an attorney, so we wouldn't write code sections, but we would write as close to what we wanted the legislation to, to turn out to be and uh, leave less work and less discretion, I guess, for the city attorney's office. Um, I don't know if that would be helpful. I don't know if that's a piece that uh, council does less of as opposed to sort of writing up a general subject and not giving as much direction. So I don't know if that piece would, would help you. Um, the priorities also can be a problem because if you can have an area that is important but not fit into your priorities. So uh, the valet parking ordinance, for instance, took a couple of years to get done. I, it's out now, so I appreciate that. But uh, it's not public safety per se. It's not heavily revenue focused per se. Um, but yet, you have a lot of problems, certainly in my area, where uh, uh, valley parkers have you know, double, triple, quadruple counted spaces, so they really have no spaces. Um, they break parking meters, so they have free places to stick their cars. Um, they then park them. They park them in permit parking districts and allow their uh, their customers to get surprise tickets. I mean, you have all these problems that you ideally wouldn't want, but they might not fit into the top priority for the city attorney's office. At the same time, you know, it's a it's something relatively serious that should be handled. So uh, I'm not sure the prioritization of the city attorney's office helps in, all, in some of these cases. In some cases, it's pretty problematic. Um, also, there are issues where I think sometimes we give clear enough direction and the city attorney's office has a policy disagreement, and so we don't necessarily get back what we want as quickly or in the form that the council has, has directed. Certainly, I, I found the medical marijuana issue probably to be, uh, for me, the most problematic example, where we can direct something and it takes a long time and it comes back. It's not what we asked for. It's more what the opinions of some in the city attorney's office, I think, would, would direct. I don't know how we, uh, we adjust for that as well. Um, another problem that... Uh, has been identified to my staff at times is the actual work might get done, but the holdup might also be that there are uh, few people in the department that actually do the final review of what is ready to be presented. So I don't know how we deal with that in a positive way. If, if the folks that are in those positions um, can give up some of their other work so they can be more focused on that piece or what. I'm not sure exactly where, where that goes as well. But You're uh, looking at the two right here. I, I, I have to tell and, you. And I, if I, both I, of you wind up doing that mm -hmm. and you have many other uh, uh, responsibilities, I don't know if there's a way to pull off some of those responsibilities to give us more ability for you not to be a two-person log jam with a massive number of ordinances right. to deal with. So, so I have to tell you, the, the, uh, one of the, and you, you're going to see how twisted my mind can be sometimes, one, one of the benefits of this discussion that, I, that occurred to me a few days ago is that we're having the discussion because to me is uh, a tacit acknowledgement of how shorthanded and how much lacking in resources we are and how critical what we do is to you and to the city. And it is, in fact, that critical. So I, I welcome the fact that we're having this discussion at all. I, I go from saying that to saying, yes, we have, we have uh, a slowdown, if you will, in the review of the ordinances. I ultimately release virtually all the ordinances and the reports that come out of the office. And I do that because, in, in part, 
I've been around the longest, and I know how the city works. I know the legal requirements. I have the breadth of knowledge that, that enables me to do that in an effective and in a good quality way. And I have looked for other attorneys in the office whom I could move from their current responsibilities to do this as well. And frankly, I, I'm at a loss right now. I am. We, we hurt any time that we move any one attorney. And, and I, you know, we have relatively young supervisors. We lost our, our top people through ERIP and other retirements even after ERIP. So we're hurting in that respect. And I, I, we try to, to move it as quickly as possible. The, the, the way, the, the reprioritizing that I've done is to come in on weekends and nights and, and do as much as I can. And Bill helps me out with it, and, and others do as well. Now, that's not to say other offices like CLA and CAO aren't being hurt as well. They are. Everybody's hurting. But it, this is, I think, a, a tacit acknowledgement of how much we are and how important our, our role is. And I, I, what I pledge to you is that we keep on trying, and I keep on uh, identifying individuals who will help in that role, and we will move it forward even, even much better than what I'm doing right now. But that, that is a problem that I see, and I've tried to work on it, and just that because of the lack of resources, have not been able to do it. Yeah. If I can, I, um, I first want to, um, I guess I'm going to date myself here, but I've been working with the city attorney since working code studies back in 1988, 89, uh, with the planning department. And I've seen your work, Mr. Chevity, and I've, I've always been grateful. And Mr. Carter's commitment to the city of LA has been. Uh, to me, uh, just uh, I, I believe you're role models to to our department. Um, but I also know that maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but because uh, the way uh, uh, term limits has affected how we have this turnaround and how we orientate ourselves to the notion of the bigger city, it, it changes because people change. Yes. And so how we adjust to those changes is, is critical. Um, I think we're at the juncture, though, where uh, there has to be an approach, a methodology, which I'm hoping we can achieve to a certain degree, how we build up our confidence and trust and what we're being told. And it's unfortunate that uh, I found myself, and I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but with the medical marijuana and other cases where I quite frankly needed to seek outside opinion because of that distrust and, and the way, uh, quite frankly, we were being treated. Uh, and it got blurred as to who was the client and who wasn't. And, and I, I think we do the city disservice when we reach those kinds of, of junctures. And I'm hoping through this process we can, we can find that uh, point of, of uh, how can I put this, uh, weakness and strengthen those, and I think that's the intent of this. And I want to thank you for that effort because I appreciate what Mr. Miller said because I think he hit it right on the head. We need to figure out how to get past those junctures that create this sense of uh, of, of um, uh, this this notion of being uh, in doubt and reinforce options because we didn't get it from the city attorney. And those are the things that we need, that we need to to promote. But uh, that doesn't take away from the history and the work that you've done uh, as, as, uh, as attorneys for the city. All right. So um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the discussion that we've had. We've identified you know, some of the um, issues that continue to need to be addressed, I think, and that we need to continue to work on. But given the fact that it is Wednesday before the Thanksgiving uh, holiday. I don't want to keep everyone uh, here a lot longer. What I, you know, I think we've we've already made some progress in identifying some of the specific things that need to be fixed. Uh, you've heard there's concern about delay, and there's a good reason I think for some of the delay, as you've identified, Pete, the limited resources that you have. But I think um, I would like us to develop some more specific strategies for monitoring the status of ordinances so that the council and each council member is fully aware of where the ordinance is within the process, number one. And number two, I think, you know, your suggestions on how to expedite that review process uh, by the office, whether it's drafting or review only, um, 
your suggestions on how we can expedite and, and make the return time more certain, given the reality of the world, which is that we live in an era right now of limited resources and limited amount of people uh, to do this work. Um, another really important point that I think we've just discussed is this issue of greater precision in policy direction. And that, in my view, is the council's problem to fix um, more than the city attorney's. And I think that's something that we should work on in developing uh, some approaches that the council might be able to take to ensure that when it comes time for the council to debate ordinance language, we know what we're talking about, we give clear direction, we get a majority of votes on something more than a general concept. And um, that, I think, comes to the issue of the drafting process within the CLA's office, subject to review as to form and legality. Um, so there's, there's room for a lot of progress here. Um, I, I would suggest that what we do is uh, continue the matter now. Um, we continue to work on developing some more specific elements of a, a framework for agreement, if you will between the city attorney's office and, and the council as to expectations and specific processes by which those expectations are going to be met. And, um, and then we'll bring that back for a more specific discussion and here at a, at a meeting to be determined still of, of this ad hoc committee. So um, okay. any, any other closing thoughts or questions or issues. Um, otherwise, um, we'll go ahead and, and continue this matter in, in the committee. And uh, I want to thank all of you for your input and for your good work on this so far. Um, we'll stick to it, and I think uh, we're going to have a good outcome to this. So thank you all very thank much. Thank you very much. Happy Thanksgiving uh, to all of you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> and we are adjourned. <laughs>